So some of the things I will say are, are going to illustrate uh, the very beginning of this um, video that you saw about the brain and how a complex system, um, what the, how complex a system we're dealing with. And in fact, let me start with my favorite PowerPoint, which is something you should all try to remember by the end of the morning, which was a summary of the situation that was uh, provided to the incoming general of the uh, Allied forces in Afghanistan. General, this is the situation in Afghanistan. Welcome. And General Miss Crystal said famously, once I'll understand this PowerPoint, we'll have won the war. <laughs> and in fact, my point is, just like the brain is a complex system, the, ju the juvenile justice system as a whole is a very complex system. And we should be under no illusion that we will master all of its intricacies, either today or any time in the future. But I do believe, to stay with the image of war, that we'll win it if we place children's rights and children as specific human beings at the center of our concerns. Let me lay out some important principles. First of all, at a superficial level, detention can be viewed as a discrete time limited period of a person's life and can be treated as such. In other words, we examine issues that relate to the space and time from the moment a person enters a detention system, whatever that means. Are we talking deprivation of liberty in an institution akin to an adult prison environment, or are we already in detention from the moment the police stops you for questioning, and even more so when you are brought in uh, uh, into a police station and booked. My sense is that in particular, and it's already been said, for children and ado adolescents, you have to adopt the least restrictive perspective. What happened in their life before some time of deprivation of liberty is probably as important, in fact, in my opinion, even more important than what takes place during a detention period behind bars. In other words, just like the Council of Europe's guidelines on child-friendly justice, we should be considering the events of detention as one in a series of events that begin way before any contact occurs with the judicial system or any system for that matter, be it social or educational. My second principle, which I think is justified uh, and brings us back to the theory of complexity, children are a heterogeneous group and no child should be mistaken for another. And here we're speaking about broad categories, so I, I really do want to make this point. Children differ in every aspect from their genetic material to the familial and social circumstances in which they are brought up in. Each child is exposed from birth onwards to a unique array of stimuli and will meet a set of people that differs from what any other child encounters. All I'm suggesting is that while we may be forced to talk of categories of children for convenience purposes, each child deprived of liberty is a different story, represents a different history, and a different developmental trajectory. The general consensus in the scientific literature is that detention has a profoundly negative impact on young people's mental health and well-being, their education, and their employment. And here we need some theory. Why is that? Well, we've known for a lot of time, and for, uh, thanks to a lot of good research, that incarceration has a profound effect on detainees. Uh, Sykes, in his uh, seminal book, focused on the pains of imprisonment, which relate to the deprivations and frustrations of prison life. This led to so, the so-called deprivation theory, which states that a person's psychological condition suffers from the loss of liberty, the loss of autonomy, the loss of material goods, the loss of heterosexual relationships, and the loss of security. This is what it means to be behind bars. To make it simple, taking a lot away from a person will make him or her very unhappy and produce pathological uh, reactions ranging from mental illness to self-directed violence such as suicide and to violence towards others. Even more simple, prison is bad. But deprivation theory must be completed with what is referred to as importation theory. 
This is also simple. The culture, beliefs, and characteristics of a detained person are imported into prison and will mostly be exacerbated. What you were before incarceration, what you were on the streets or in your family, comes along with you when you are behind bars. And unless this is forcefully addressed by treatment and rehabilitation programs, it stays the same or even gets worse during detention. And this is very bad news. Why is it bad news? Because of the mental health prevalence problem. Young people in detention are high-risk population, which often have unmet physical, developmental, and especially mental health needs. If you look at the research, you'll find alarming rates of prevalence for mental disorders in the juvenile justice population. Um, a colleague from WHO cites a basket of studies that shows that the prevalence of mental health disorders in juvenile justice populations is above 50% of adolescents, 50%, compared to 10 to 20% in the general population. For example, Shelton uh, conducted a well-regarded research which, uh, in which she identifies 53% of the youth 12 to 20 who are uh, behind bars as exhibiting diagnostic criteria for uh, psychiatric disorder. And most notably, most of these children have never been identified to have psychiatric issues before they came into the prison system. Here's the breakdown of some of the mental health categories that come out of her research. Historically, the top researcher on the question of mental health prevalence in detention facilities, Linda Teplin, has studied very large samples of incarcerated juveniles in the US. She has found that testing um, at intake, that is shortly after they enter a detaining facility, that huge percentages of children and adolescents present ver verifiable mental health problems. Let me be very specific. This is the case even if you exclude conduct disorders, which are a very common condition uh, among uh, children who are deprived of liberty. And you can go through some of the other, some of the, the, the data yourself. I'm not going to go into the details. What I would like to also point out is that in the past few years, with a very different methodological approach, very significant research has been carried out by various sub-teams uh, under my friend Tom Grisso's guidance using what is called the the MAZI, the Massachusetts Youth Screening Instrument. And this instrument has a, a certain number of scales that evaluates uh, the frequency and extent of alcohol and drug use, uh, feelings of anger and resentment, feeling of depression and anxiety, suicide ideation, thoughts of self-harm, all of this for children who enter a detention system and as well a seventh scale which uh, examines the traumatic experience that they may have experienced ahead of that. The MISI does not provide for psychiatric diagnoses. The pr primary purpose of this test is to screen a, in a pool of young people who self-reported mental or emotional conditions require further clinical attention. And, what, and here's what I want to underscore. And because it is, a, it is a test that is administered with the help of frontline intake staff, it is a very powerful tool for staff members to be sensitized to the issues that each adolescent or child carries into the facility. For the majority of children and adolescents, detention makes things worse. If you were depressed before you come to prison, chances are your depression will be imported and because you suffer from deprivation your, deprivation, your depression will intensify. This is why suicidal ideation and behavior are so frequent within youth prison populations. Suicide rates are four times higher than in the general population and significantly more violent. The example of swallowing a spoon is a really pretty awful thing to try out. 
Why is this? Many juvenile facilities are overcrowded, they breed violence and chaos for children and adolescents, and then because in many instances the young detainees do not receive effective treatment. And then again, detention makes things worse because it interferes with a natural process which is called aging out. As many as a third of young people will engage in delinquent behavior before they grow up, but will naturally age out of the delinquent behavior of their younger years. While this rate of delinquency among young males may seem high, the rate at which they end their criminal behavior is equally very high. It's called the desistance rate. Most youth will desist from delinquency on their own. For those who have more trouble, it has been shown that establishing good programs that deal with education, mentoring, and so on, and so on, rehabilitation of various kinds will really make a big difference. Youth who have experienced trauma may be more likely to be involved in illegal behavior for a variety of reasons, including the neurological, psychological, and social effects of trauma. A growing body of research in developmental neuroscience has begun to uncover the pervasive detrimental effects of traumatic stress on the developmental, development of the brain. So these adverse childhood experiences will really have long, lifelong consequences. The majority of brain development is completed during the first five years of life, with the most critical development occurring within the first two years. Considering that the average first trauma exposure in children when, who experience trauma occurs at five years old, the experience of trauma in childhood is likely to impact on critical aspects of brain development. These brain structures are responsible for regulating emotion, memory, and behavior, and they develop rapidly in the first few years of life. And they're very sensitive to damage from the effects of emotional and, or physical stress, including neglect. Some of these structures are measurably smaller, physical structures in the brain, smaller in abuse survivors, and irregular brain activity in these areas among abuse survivors is correlated with an increased frequency of violence. People who have experienced trauma often have abnormal blood levels of stress hormones, and other parts, and the parts of the brain responsible for managing stress may not function as well as in people who have, been, have not been exposed to trauma. People who experience trauma as children are more likely as well to develop long life, lifelong psychiatric conditions, including personality disorders, conduct disorder, depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth. And this leads to decreased cognitive abilities, learning abilities, disabilities, lower IQ levels. And this has all been observed in children who have experienced trauma at a younger age. Research also shows, I hope you're going to get my point, that a majority of young people with these histories experienced school problems, became school, school dropouts, and in general have been experienced a lot more trauma in addition to the initial neglect than their peers. So although, although not every young person in conflict with the law has experienced traumatic victimization, there are many studies that include, in, indicate, and hear this well, three out of four young people in the juvenile justice system have been exposed to severe victimization. Three out of four. When exposed to trauma or mistreatment, a young person may cope by resorting to indifference, defiance, or aggression as self-protective reactions. In these cases, risk-taking, breaking rules, fighting back, hurting others who are perceived to be powerful or vulnerable may become a way to survive emotionally or even literally outside of a detention center and within a detention center. We've heard of these informal power structures. They're not random. It seems that traumatic stress symptoms worsen as a result of juvenile justice system involvement. For youth who have experienced trauma who are entering the justice system, the process of arrest and incarceration can itself represent a traumatic event. Court hearings, 
detention, incarceration are inherently stressful, and stressful experiences that are not traumatic per se can exacerbate trauma symptoms. Girls in particular may be susceptible to trauma after incarceration due to their high rates of exposure to traumatic stress and the possibility of re-traumatization. Seclusion and restraint in psychiatric units is cited as an example of a practice that can be re-traumatizing. Interventions at times of crisis in detention facilities include the presence of male security staff for girls, being strapped to a bed, forced medication, seclusion, forced disrobing, forced physical exams, invasive body searches, just to cite a few of the things you probably would not want to experience as uh, fully functioning adults. No wonder that self-harm <clears throat> frequently occurs during these crisis moments. Last but not least, staff insensitivity to the loss of privacy can exacerbate negative feelings created by previous victimization especially among PTSD survivors and girls. Young people in correctional facilities are frequently exposed to verbal and physical aggression, which can intensify fear or traumatic symptoms. This brings me to the last part of my intervention, which will be rather short. In fact, only two key words to remember. The first, Actually, I'll repeat it three times, so it will be six words in all. Training, training, training. Holistic interdisciplinary training in children's rights, mental health issues, child and, ad and adolescent interviewing techniques. And the guide brings this up, and the chair brought up early on, right at the start of our meeting, the importance of establishing trust, and that's a very fundamental element of interviewing children. This should be standard training for all of those who are in contact with children passing through the judicial system. Law enforcement staff, lawyers, judges, social workers, prison staff, teachers, monitoring bodies, everyone. Doesn't happen that way. In my country, in Switzerland, probably in a few exceptions, but generally it probably doesn't happen in most countries. Comprehensive training for all people involved with children going through any kind of contact with the judicial system. It's such a simple proposition. It should be just as simple to implement. Probably not. And the second word that I would like to, to underscore as a conclusion is diversion, diversion, diversion. Any kid you can keep out of a detention facility, out of the traditional repressive judicial system is a gain for future society. Again, we create more damage with these detention facilities than we really correct. And while you may feel it's a short-term gain, long-term loss is huge, not only for the individual concerned, but society as a whole, because again, you've come up with a solution to making a problem for this youth worse. Think of it. The, we should be protective in our attitude toward children who have tr in conflict with the law. And we're not being protective. We're making things worse for a majority of these children. There's something completely upside down in this whole system. So let me just conclude by saying that this guide is so significantly important because it tries to bring together different strands of the necessary responses to correcting how these institutions function, not only by bringing in the standards, but also by suggesting that mental health, psychological aspects of the monitoring process should also be taken into account. And I think, unfortunately, there's a long life left for monitoring bodies to carry out their work before we can shelve the monitoring guide. Thank you very much.